Good morning. Uh, this morning we'll be reading 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 through 15. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labor we worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busybodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him, that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. This is the word of our Lord. Well, good morning, everyone. How are we doing today? That's what I like to hear. Uh, my name is Jace. I'm the youth pastor here. And if you, uh, if you happen to make it through our main doors, if you happen to make it into the doors of the sanctuary or make it through the line of the coffee shop and no one said good morning and welcome, well, good morning and welcome. Welcome to Desert Breeze. But I, I, just, I have a feeling that you got that two or three times already. We love, we love seeing you here each and every week. And I love that I have the chance to wrap up this series on First and Second Thessalonians. For everyone watching online, Welcome as well. Second Thessalonians, if you haven't been with us for the last couple of weeks, you could probably actually catch up in the first couple minutes of my intro here. Only a few chapters, just three chapters to get caught up on. A book written by the Apostle Paul as, as a follow-up of sorts to a previous letter he had written to the Thessalonians less than a year prior. First Thessalonians was written to a small church facing obscene amounts of persecution. Yet Paul's tone is super supportive and encouraging because of all the great stories of faith he had heard. A second letter to the Thessalonians became necessary when this same heavily persecuted church started to believe some false rumors that were floating around regarding the second coming of Jesus. Had it already happened? Did we miss it? What's going on? What do we do? So Paul, he takes to a letter and he addresses these rumors. He dispels the lies. He explains that there are certain events that still need to happen first. He explains that Oprah, I mean the Antichrist, still hasn't made an appearance. I knew that would wake you up. Antichrist still has not made an appearance yet. And as we roll into chapter 3, Paul addresses some behavior of certain groups of people that they've decided we're just going to quit our jobs so that we can be fully ready and focused on Christ's return. Other people have decided to turn their attention to other people's affairs and have let it turn into gossip, while still others have completely turned away from Paul's previous teachings and have turned away from the gospel. And as we study this chapter, let's keep in mind that even though we are not in first century Thessalonica, we are still believers that are awaiting Christ's return. We are waiting with an anxiousness and a hope, and we're looking for direction and hope in our everyday living. With that, let's pray. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you that we can join together as a church body. We can worship you. We can lift our voices and our hearts to you. Lord, please bless this time as we dive into your word. Please speak through me. Please be with us as as we walk through this chapter and wrap up this series and help us all to realize that, yes, as we anxiously await your return, there is still hope for us in what we do each and every day as we wait. We love you, Lord. Be with us now. Amen. All right, let me take you back in time real quick to my college days. Uh, The year was 2008, and 
I know, either that makes me really young or really old. I, yeah, <laughs> depending on who you are and where you're at in life. The year is 2008, and uh, when summers came around during college, I realized that if I wanted to continue uh, with college and maintain the lifestyle that I had, like eating every day, I had to get a job. So I worked in a flooring warehouse during summers, and actually the warehouse is right on the other side of I-17 in Bell, really close to here. And there's really not too many cool stories about the job itself. Uh, just imagine giving me, a college kid, a key to a forklift, uh, but then also showing me on the wall the, the, the list of OSHA laws, and then seeing how many of those laws I could break simultaneously. Uh, it's just, uh, how crazy can we get? So, but usually in the warehouse, it was, it was me and two other guys. I had a coworker and I had a manager. And for a couple of summers, it was a kid named Aaron who I worked with. And we were kind of the low on the totem pole guys doing all the hard work. And so we had a manager, but we also had a general manager. His name was Tony that would come around. He visited all the stores. Tony was the guy who hired me. And I remember sitting with him in the interview and he said, Jace, I want you to remember this as, as an employee here. Uh, even if you think you're not busy, stay busy anyways. And you tell that to a college kid, that means absolutely nothing. But I said, sure, you're paying me 10 bucks an hour. I'm like, sure, I'll, I'll do it. Uh, so, so we get this job, we start working, and, and we're weeks into summer, and it's one of those days where all the customers have come in, it's that early morning rush, we're selling flooring supplies, they're off to their jobs for the day, and there's kind of a lull. And we remember, okay, even if we're not busy, stay busy anyway. So we grab our clipboards and we look official and we start doing inventory and, you know, other important sounding terms. And, and we're, we're walking around the warehouse and we're going through, we're just making sure everything's correctly on the shelf, the right numbers are all, you know. And all of a sudden we come across this really big item that's covered by a tarp. And of course, you know, we're taking inventory, so we need to figure out what this is. We pull the tarp back and we reveal a ping pong table. This excites me. This, is ex this excites me because some of you may know this, some of you may not, but ping pong is actually one of my spiritual gifts. Uh, and, and, and to see, especially college Jace. College Jace missed a lot of classes because of ping pong uh, and Halo 3. And, uh, no, uh, but I missed a lot of classes and I love ping pong. So I'm looking at Aaron and I go, hey, this is a part of inventory. This is an item that's in the warehouse. We need to make sure that everything's in good working order here. We have all the pieces necessary just in case a customer ever asks. So we pull the ping pong table down, we find the net, and we find the ping pong balls, we find some, some paddles, and we start playing. And we start just volleying back and forth, we play a game. Now, we all know that ping pong has, has a very unique sound. You know, it goes back and forth. This catches the attention of Mario. Uh, he works for another company in the warehouse. We shared some space, and he comes over, and he does what any guy does in this moment. He goes, I got next game. I got winner. So, so we're playing, and you know, long story short, I win. Uh, so, so Mario steps up, and he says, all right, I want to play. But I don't play for free. Now, I know, I can tell. That, that set a few of you off right there. So, fun fact about me, I grew up a good Baptist boy. I don't, I don't gamble, you know, at least in that stage of life. Uh, and I, I don't know. I, I mean, the fact, the mantra that I live by is I don't drink or smoke or chew or go with girls that do. And, and so he says, we play for money. I say, absolutely not. That's, we're just playing for fun. And he goes, what are you? chicken? So I go all Marty McFly on him. Nobody calls me a chicken. So I say, okay, let's play for money. He takes his, his money clip out, takes his wallet out, and he's, try, he's trying to intimidate me. He takes his money and he goes, okay, 50, 100, 150. He's just pulling. And, and if you know me, I refuse to be intimidated. And so I pull my wallet out and I start counting bills. One, two, three, all the way up to five. So we play that game for $5, and I won. So I'm like, sweet, I just made $5. Mario wasn't done. He goes, okay, we're going to play double or nothing. And I can do quick math. Wait a sec, if I lose, I say, yeah, let's play for $10. 
Let's play for $20. I keep winning. Let's play for $40. Let's play for $80. Let's play for $160. Let's play for whatever 160 times 2 is. All right? So let's, and we're playing, and I start to really fall in love with this statement. You know, if you love what you do, you don't work a day in your life. I totally get it now. Like, I'm making so much money. And we're in the middle of this game, and all of a sudden, the front door of the warehouse opens. And in my, you know, making money naivety, thing, oh, it's just a customer. Aaron can go help him out. It's not just a customer. This is Tony. This is the GM. He walks in. And when you're in the middle of a ping pong game, when you're supposed to be moving bags of concrete and thin set, it's, 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 hard, to, it's hard to hide that. <laughs> so he's just looking at me, and I'm looking at him, and I look at Mario and say, uh, game over. You can pay up later. Uh, and, and Tony comes over to me, and this is not a Christian environment. You know, he, he, I don't hold him to the same standards of, that I would hold you if you got mad at me. And, and, and he unloads the most creative, foul string of sentences about me, about my character, about my work ethic, about my lack of devotion to the company, about my, my laziness and uh, you know, inability to take directions. And of course, I, I'm just, I'm just you know, profusely apologizing. Uh, let, me, let me get back to work. Let me, let me jump back in. It's never going to happen again because even though in the moment I thought all the work was done, and I thought I could get away with playing some ping pong, there was still more work to be done. Now, some of you might be wondering, did Mario pay me? Yes, he did. And I tithed off of it, so I think that's fine. <laughs> uh, maybe. Okay, it's probably, it's probably not. It's probably, I should probably move on now. So, so how does this story relate to the message? Or what, what am I doing telling this story? Well, the whole premise around Paul writing this book of 2 Thessalonians is because there is a large contingent of people that have been misled or who are just actively going out of the way to mislead themselves, and they think that the day of the Lord has come. They think that the work is done, and we could just hang out. It's just, just throw down a beach chair and just look to the skies and do nothing else. They think that the work is done. Now, there's also some groups that, that they, they think, I, I don't need to necessarily quit my job, but I need to watch other people really closely as they do their job. And I need to kind of step into their business, and I need to tell them what to do. I need to tell them how to live their lives. And, you know, forget about what I'm going through. Forget about what I'm struggling with. I'm going to make sure that all of you know that you're struggling and that I can walk you through that. And, of course, there's even that last group that says, you know, it, maybe it's already happened, maybe it's not, but let's forget everything we've ever learned and let's just do our own thing all the time. But this group, this, this, this group of lazy people, this group in mind, he writes a very special note. Paul writes a very special note as he closes out this book. Now, before he drops this holy hand grenade on people, he has a, and this is your first blank, he has a request for his brothers in Thessalonica. He says in verse 1 and 2, finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you, that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not all have faith. Keep in mind that chapter 2 just ended with a prayer that Paul spoke over the Thessalonians, asking God to comfort their hearts, asking God to establish them in every good work and deed. So this sets up the beginning of this final chapter quite nicely. Paul's saying, I'm praying for you, so please pray for us and pray for the gospel. Now, I love that, that, that Paul, he doesn't see the gospel. You know, the story of Jesus' love for us is just some story on a scroll. Paul doesn't go town to town, city to city, country to country with his, with his snake oil wagon like, hear ye, hear ye, have you, have you heard about the truth of Jesus? Come to me, you all need to hear this. No, he doesn't do that. He sees the gospel, the good news that the Son of God took on flesh. He came to this earth, lived a perfect life, died on the cross for our sins, rose again. We'll be celebrating it in just a few weeks. And he is in heaven now offering us the free gift of eternal life. He saw this as ultimate truth, and he saw it as a living entity. 
So when he says, pray that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored, he is saying with, with ultimate reverence that the truth of Jesus is real and it is on the move and it is penetrating the hearts and lives of many. There's so much to learn from these verses, but a real easy kind of succinct way to describe it is that he wants, he wants us to pray for God's message, and these are next blank, and his messengers. Paul says, pray for the gospel, that it would be heard, honored, and received. Paul also says, pray for us. He's talking about himself, Silvanus and Timothy. Pray for the messengers. Pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men because not everyone is totally receptive of the gospel. Not everyone has faith. Now, this request means a lot to this original audience because if we think back kind of over the scope of this series, especially the first week when Pastor Mark was teaching, we remember that, that Paul and his guys, they were driven out of Thessalonica by a violent mob. We remember that even as he went down the road to Berea, that same crowd followed him and continued to harass him and continued to go after him. So when Paul says, pray for us that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, he is not exaggerating at all. And what's really cool is that this is not, it's not a one-time thing for Paul to ask for prayer. You'll see in your bulletin and you'll see on the screen, I tried to fill it up with all these cross-references where Paul asks for prayer from his friends and from supporters. He asks for prayer from the local churches all over the world, Rome, Corinth, Ephesus, Philippi, and even other places. He knows that he can only get so far on his own strength. He needs the strength of the Lord and the support of believers all around the world. Paul shows us something very important, and I would challenge you, if this is, if this is not already a permanent part in your prayer time or in your study time, I would challenge you to add it. Are we taking the time to lift up the power and progress of the gospel? Are we taking the time to, to lift up those who, who make a daily priority to carry it? I think our prayers sometimes are really often centered on, Lord, bless the food. Lord, give us safe travels. Lord, protect us as we go to and from the office. Lord, protect our kids at school. Do we often forget to ask for opportunities to share the gospel? to share our testimony, to share what God has done for us. And when I say messengers, I'm not only talking about, you know, the vocationally paid pastor. Now, speaking for us, I appreciate the prayers, bring them on, but if you, any one of you, any one of us, we make that decision and we say that I, I admit that I am a sinner in need of a Savior, I believe that, that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven, I confess Him as my Lord and Lord of my life, then guess what? Each and every one of us carry the title of messenger. Are we praying that that message would be carried and for those who carry it? After Paul makes his request for prayer, here's your next blank. He offers reassurance in verses 3 through 5. Those verses read like this, but the Lord is faithful he will establish you and guard you against the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord about you that you are doing and will do the things that we command. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. So in this section right here, we get the first of two promises in this chapter. Now, I promise not to spend too much time on it right now because I want to circle back at the end of our sermon today, but we get our first promise. The first promise is right at the beginning of verse 3. The Lord is faithful. In fact, as we, as we hear those words, I'm going to take a page out of Pastor Ray's book right now. And I just want to invite everyone in the room to take a deep breath. And maybe in your hearts or out loud, I just want you to say, the Lord is faithful. Hmm. I have a feeling that there's at least one person in here 
that needs to hear that reminder, that needs to say those words out loud, to think those words, to place those words on their heart. I look around and I, I see so many, so many great people sitting in here, and it's what, what a privilege it is to be here at church and, and, and worshiping together and, and, and being in commun- community and fellowship. But there might be some of you, there might even just be one of you who's sitting in here and you feel like, yes, I'm at church, but the walls are closing in right now. Yes, I'm at church, but I don't know what I'm going to do when I go out those doors because I just lost my job this last week and I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do when I get home because there's, there's a mountain of bills that need to be paid and I don't know how that's going to happen. I don't know what to do when I go out those doors because maybe, maybe you're fighting with your spouse right now. Maybe you're fighting with a sibling right now. Maybe, maybe there's a child at home that, that you just are at such odds with and you don't have a solution. Maybe you got a call this last week from your doctor and they say, hey, we got the results from your test and we're stumped. We don't know what to do. Remember these words, the Lord is faithful. In fact, that's your, that's your blank there. The Lord is faithful to you. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. When I hear those words, establish you and guard you, I don't know what word picture that creates in your mind, but for me, I go, I go medieval. I think a huge castle. I think high walls, I think a big moat around, I think, I think a huge gate that it takes you know, the strength of 10 men to lift up and down. I see guards everywhere. I see all sorts of weaponry that's meant to, to defend the castle from any oncoming army. That's what I see. When Paul gives us these words, he will establish you and guard you against the evil one, this impenetrable fortress of his faithfulness. I'm so grateful that the Bible is full of examples of God's faithfulness. I put, put Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 and 23 in your bulletin. The book of Lamentations is fascinating. It, 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 the whole premise of the book, and, and the, the general belief is that it's the prophet Jeremiah that, that wrote this book, and as he's writing, he is actively witnessing the destruction of the city of Jerusalem and the downfall of the temple. He is watching these iconic walls burn. And what he writes, as the Babylonians are destroying the city and wiping out the temple, is so incredibly says, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The walls were falling, the temple was burning, but God's faithfulness was not in doubt. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, and it's an oldie but a goodie, but it, but it says this, no temptation has overtaken you that is common, or excuse me, not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. He is faithful. He knows our limitations. He is faithful to provide an escape and even the ability to endure. So whatever's going on in your heart, your life, your world right now, and you think, I don't have what it takes, guess what? He is faithful enough to give you exactly what it takes and what you need. Please remember that. 2 Timothy 2.13 says this, even when we are faithless, he remains faithful. How encouraging. This reminder actually leads us to to our next fill in the blank. He is faithful to us. Let's be faithful to him. Therefore, be faithful to him. 
Just a reminder, verse 5 says, May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. I love the use of the word steadfastness here in the ESV. And, and just, again, that picture that it creates. The definition says this, the quality of being resolutely or, undutif- or dutifully firm and unwavering. There are so many words to describe Jesus. There are so many words to describe what he's done, all within the context of his love for us. But to use that word unwavering, what a picture of strength. What a picture of faithfulness. Paul says in this verse that our hearts should turn toward our unwavering Lord and Savior. His steadfastness will move us, will stir us, to be faithful to him like he is faithful to us. And with that, I can say that the warm-up for this sermon is over because it's, it's time for Paul to lay the smack down on some, some poor unfortunate souls here. I'm sort of, all right? So for this next section, I'm actually going to break a preaching rule right here, and I'm going to give you all the fill-in-the-blanks at once. You can get it all written down because I'm going to bounce around a little bit. And in case we're writing and looking and listening, let's not get confused. So uh, throw that next slide up there. Uh, the, 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 the easiest way to describe Paul's tone in this section is that of a reprimand. He, he kind of turns his tone a little bit and he brings a reprimand against laziness, against gossip, and against disobedience. So go ahead and write that down real quick if you're, if you're actively taking notes. Laziness, gossip, and disobedience. Now, I want to illustrate why I'm bouncing around this section a little bit. Uh, and to help out, I have a slide that has uh, this whole section all together. So throw up that next slide for me. I know, a lot of words, small font. This was our reading earlier, but I, I've, you know, I'm going to make it colorful to help out. So this is the entire section right here. Now, in verses 6 and 14, throw up that slide with the red on it. In verses 6 and 14, we see Paul's direction on how to treat people that are kind of uh, behaving outside the boundaries and tradition of what Paul and Jesus have passed along. Now, throw up that next slide with the blue in verses 7 through 13, and in verse 15, we get a very clear view of what the expectations are in regards to our behavior. Now, keep in mind, contextually, he is writing to a group of believers who are trying to figure out what day-to-day life looks like as we anxiously await the return of Jesus. So he, he leads off the section. If you want, you can pull this off uh, so we don't have to just do like this. No, there's no way. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Yeah, back there, that's totally fine. He leads off the section with a command. Now, we know it's a command because he says, I command you. Uh, we did not, I don't have to look too deep for that one. But this, we, we pick up on the tone real quick. The command in verse 6 says, keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you have received from us. Now, looking ahead a few verses, you see the same verbiage in verse 14. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with them that we, or excuse me, that he may be ashamed. So, twice in one paragraph, Paul says to keep away from lazy people and have nothing to do with disobedient people. Now, this is a fun part because I can look around, I can make eye contact with a few of you, and I can tell wheels are turning right now. All right. (laughs) So, I get to keep away from lazy people, turn away from disobedient people. Who did Jace just say that I can just, you know, out of my life right now? Like, how can I make this happen? So, uh, before, before you do that, though, before you remove, you know, you know, weird Uncle Steve because he doesn't have a job or, you know, crazy cousin Karen because she doesn't vote the same way you do, like, that's not what I'm saying right now. Paul, in his words, you do the study, you look at his tone, you look at the, you look at the basis and origin of the language that he's using. He is not talking about excommunication here. He is not saying that you need to cancel these people like today's culture says, just dump them and be done. He's not saying that. Uh, Now, I say this with confidence mostly because of what Paul says in verse 15. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. 
Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Keeping away from a brother who is walking in idleness and having nothing to do with the disobedient person is pointing more toward what we should do with them in regards to their behavior as opposed to just deleting them from our lives. We all know what it's like to spend too much time with a person or people who are a bad influence on us. This line lands really well with teenagers. You know, you spend too much time with the bad influence that you're going to start to look, you're going to start to act like these people, you're going to start to talk like these people, and eventually your heart is going to change to be like people that are a bad influence. Paul is saying to these active believers to stay away from the behavior of these outliers who have become lazy, stay away and do not turn away from the truth as they have. Instead, do this. He goes on to say that if there, is, if there is any doubt on how to act, then remember how we acted when we came and visited you just a number of months ago. He uses the word imitate twice in the middle of the passage. And this is not the only time that Paul uses the word imitate in, in his letters. In fact, in 1 Corinthians, Philippians, and 2 Timothy, we learn that when Paul says, imitate me, or imitate us, what he is saying is imitate me as I imitate Christ. And in 2 Thessalonians 3, imitate me as I imitate Christ means this. It means work hard and contribute as we all await the second coming of Jesus. Work hard so as not to be a financial burden on people. Work hard even to the point of letting your next meal be the motivation. Work hard, focus on your own work instead of focusing on the affairs of others. Now this is where he gets into the gossip and this is where he uses that, it's just kind of a funny word, stay busy in your work but don't be busy bodies. I remember during the reading a few minutes ago I heard a few chuckles going out, don't be busy bodies. I, it, I feel like, and maybe I didn't do enough research on this, but if I did do a word study on, on the word busybodies there, I think what I would find is this, a busybody, simply defined, someone who spends too much time on Facebook, all right? <laughs> someone who spends too much time posting and commenting and, 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 and trying to stir up trouble, spending too much time. We're posting all the negative stuff, all this horrible stuff, all this stuff about what we don't like about what's going on in society. How about this? How about instead of being a busybody in that way and, and, and posting too much and saying too much, and how about we post about what we're for as opposed to what we're against? How about we, how about we make it a point when we're interacting with people, whether face-to-face -face or online, as opposed to saying what's the, the horrible things that are going on? Why don't we talk about Jesus? Why don't we talk about Christ-glorifying things? And when people know that what we're for, then all of a sudden more and more conversations start to open up and we can have real dialogue. So when Paul says, get to work and, and, and do your work, do what you're for, don't focus on what you're against and don't focus on what other people are against. He's saying, don't be busybodies. Quit the gossip. Get back to work. Okay, soapbox moment over. All right, let's get back on track. Work hard and don't grow weary of doing that good work. It may not always be appreciated or noticed in this life, but our God in heaven is watching. You'll see in your bulletin cross-references there that, that we were created to work, and we were created to work hard. In Genesis 2, even before the fall, even before sin entered the world, God put Adam in the Garden of Eden, and he said, work it and keep it. Proverbs is full of examples about working hard and the importance of it. Avoid being lazy. Proverbs is also full of many examples that speak out against gossip. And I also gave you Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30, the parable of the talents. There is reward for hard work and being faithful to the master. And the slothful, lazy one is known as being worthless and should be cast out. 
We're also given many examples on how to treat the disobedient. I strongly recommend as you go through the growing notes this week and you look through all these cross-references, check them out, and we learn about how to treat the disobedient. Paul ends the chapter and the book with a blessing of peace. He writes this, Now may the Lord of peace, in verse 16, may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. This is a sign of genuineness in every letter of mine. It is the way I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Your final blanks from this chapter is that we would receive the peace and presence of God. It's no mistake that Paul ends the second of his two letters to the Thessalonians with a blessing of peace and a promise of peace, that second promise. The promise of faithfulness came at the top and the promise of peace comes at the end. As I've stated, and Pastor Ray and Pastor Mark have stated throughout this series, this is a church that's struggling. This is a church that's doing many incredible things in the face of adversity, but it's still a church that's struggling. What happens to our friends that have died? Where are our leaders? Is Jesus coming back? When is he coming back? Has he already come back? We don't know. What should we do in the meantime? What should our day-to-day life look like as we wait? It's a struggle that we can relate to. Because if you can imagine what the Thessalonians are are worried about, guess what? 2,000 years have passed. We're still waiting. But no matter how much time has passed, the message has not changed. And our desire every single day should be to live in accordance with the gospel and what God would have us do. Let me end with this. I brought you something. All right. So, some of you guys have keypads and security systems on your walls. If you try to break into my house, I have a gun. I don't know. I I don't know. I (laughs) know. No, I have this sword, and fun fact about this sword, it's a replica that comes off the movie set Conan the Barbarian. I've never actually seen it, so I'm not gonna try to, I'm not gonna try to quote Arnold right now. Uh, I know I look like him, so it just kind of makes sense. The sword is the one that's squeaking, not me, because of how heavy it is. This truly is a beautiful sword. You look at kind of the the ornate designs that are on it, the colors, it's not very sharp, so I can hold it like this. And you look at this, you go, wow, this is really cool. And at the end of service, if you think this is cool, you come check it out. That's fine. I'll leave it up here. But a sword like this, you you don't just start piecing little pieces of metal together and gold. You're not gonna find stuff that's that's smooth and really ornate and beautiful like this? No. It takes quite a process to make something like this. And really all the information I have on this is what I've learned from movies, but when I watch (laughs) swords get made, it takes so much time. You start off with this misshaped piece of metal, and what do you got to do? You got to drop it in the fire. And once it gets nice and hot, you got to take a hammer and you got to pound it. And you slowly start to reshape it. And after it takes a beating, you drop it in cold water to cool it. And then what do you do? Drop it right back in the fire. Reshape it a little bit more. Smooth it out a little bit more. You do it over and over and over again. And even last night, I learned a little bit more about the process. Even at the end, when you're just about there, you turn the fire up even more and you temper the steel and you harden it so it's ready for battle. And then only at the end do you put a shine on it, do you put an edge on it, do you put the handle on it and you go, wow, this is a beautiful 
sword. When I look at a sword like this, I, yes, it's beautiful, but when you think even more about the process that it takes, how much do we like this sword? How much are the Thessalonians like this sword, except they're kind of in the phase right now where they're getting thrown in the fire, and they don't know what's going on because it just hurts. They're in the phase right now where they're getting pounded with hammers because they're being reshaped. Maybe you came to church today and you feel like you're in the fire and you don't know why. Maybe you came to church today and you feel like the whole world's just beating me with hammers and I don't know why. If that's you, then cling tightly to the words that we learn in 2 Thessalonians 3. Cling tightly to the two promises that were given at the beginning and end of the chapter. Cling tightly to the fact that God is faithful. And cling tightly to the fact that he offers you peace, unending, always with you peace. And when you're thrown off about what to do in day-to-day -day life, when you're thrown off about, okay, what should my life look like while I wait? What should my life look like as all this, this just garbage is happening to me and people are hurting me and they're turning against me? And, and I, God, you're faithful. God, you give me peace. And God, I know that you're going to keep doing this work in me so that one day I too can be this beautiful sword. So if that hits you in any way at all, then don't forget those words. He is faithful and he will bring you peace. That was his message to the Thessalonians and that's his message to you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this opportunity. Lord, I don't belong up here, but I'm glad that your Holy Spirit has spoken through me. Lord, if there is anyone in here that's hurting, remind them of your faithfulness because it is great. If there's anyone in here that is just feeling out of place, that is feeling like there is no peace, that there is just heart-pounding anxiety all the time, give them this reminder that your peace is always there and it's never-ending. Lord, these words meant so much to their original audience, and they mean so much more to us today as we continue to anxiously await your return. Help us to remember that in our day-to-day, -day, we need to work hard for you, and we need to glorify you with everything that we do, not focus on the affairs of others, but focus on what you would have for us and that surrounding it all is your peace, your presence, and your faithfulness. We love you, Lord. Amen. 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 Uh, thanks for being with us today. Uh, if, if you have any questions or you're looking for prayer uh, or you want to learn more about baptism, please join us. If you just want to come see the sword, come on up here. We have uh, elders and pastors available as well. Have a great Sunday. <laughs>